information is physical. Information is not a disembodied abstract entity. It is always tied to a physical implementation. It is represented by engraving on a stone tablet, a spin, a charge, a hole in a punch card, a mark on paper or some other equivalent. This ties the handling of information to all the possibilities and restrictions of our real physical world, its laws of physics and its storehouse of available parts. This is from a paper by Landauer in 1996. In the last video, I explored the problem of dissipating heat from current CMOS chips. Now, given human creativity, we can expect that there'll be innovative gate designs that will allow even smaller components consuming less energy. And the key to cooling lies in the heat release per square centimetre. One clear solution has been to lower operating voltages. However, this brings into play, as I talked about before, a trade-off between gate voltage and reliability. Lowering gate voltages compromises gate reliability due to thermal noise. I presented it before in terms of a purely statistical um, argument from shock, theory, shock noise, but the specific form of the, the noise is a square root law, but it um, the noise voltage is proportional to the kT over the capacitance. So the smaller the capacitance, the higher the relative shot noise, and the higher the relative noise voltage. And capacitance will square by the chip's minimum feature size. So halving the feature size results in a doubling of the thermal noise voltage, because obviously area goes down by four. And if we continuously reduce the size of transistors, you would have to increase the operating voltage. Uh, and this has big consequences for power consumption, because power consumption rises as the square of the voltage. We can see these two power laws intersect here. An ongoing reduction in CMOS gate size will encounter a limit due to noise-related power consumption per square centimetre, which correlates with the square of the feature size. Ha halving the feature size would result under these circumstances, once you reached the threshold of, of um, thermal noise, to an increase in power consumption at a constant uh, uh, clock speed. You halve the feature size four, four times as much power consumption per area. And this would effectively establish a minimum energy usage for reliable CMOS gate operations. Um, we've shown that progress continues to be made. Newer Apple chips are much more efficient in this respect than older um, AMD chips, but is there a ground floor to this? What we've said up to now is lim linked to the specific properties of CMOS, but there's a broader question. Is there a fundamental lower limit to the power consumption that any cons computer will have? Uh, the physicist Landau, who I mentioned before, addressed this and saying, yes, there is. And his reasoning was what, what in that time, a very innovative synthesis of Boltzmann and Shannon. He was able to... Well, let's see. The first point is he noted that if we build our computers of and or not gates, two of those gates or an AND are information destroying. There are two inputs in an AND gate and one output. This reduces the amount of information every time you go through an AND gate. And since information is equal to entropy, it would appear 
to be a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, which says you can't reduce the entropy of a closed system. The question arises, he asked, what becomes of the entropy of the discarded bit? You start with two bits of information, end up with one bit, one bit of information has disappeared somewhere. What happens to it? It can't just simply disappear because you can't reduce the entropy of a closed system. So it must be converted into heat. And then by applying Boltzmann's constant, which we saw in the last equation for, for thermal noise, he calculates the minimum energy dissipation that can occur when a bit is discarded. I mean, a not gate has one input and one output and doesn't lose any bits. But both AND and OR gates have two inputs and one output and therefore lose a bit every time you go through them. His formula was that the heat lost in an AND gate, the minimum heat discarded to the environment, has to be KT log, natural log of 2. And why is KT are as before in the thermal noise equation? But the natural log of 2 is there because Boltzmann assumed natural logs when he computed K, whereas Shannon assumed log to the base 2 when measuring bits. But that's just a conversion between bases of logarithms. Now, let's apply Shannon's for, sorry, Landauer's formula to the K10 chip which I looked at in the last video. Boltzmann's constant is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23. I'm going to assume the chip is operating at the 300 degrees Kelvin. And that log, natural log of 2 is 0.69. So the energy released each time an AND gate operates, the minimum energy released according to the laws of thermodynamics has to be 2.7 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. If we have 50 million gates, 50 million AND gates, and they're operating at a gigahertz, that boosts it up to 1.43 times 10 to the minus 4 watts. Now that is a tiny amount of electricity, a tiny amount of power. It's about a millionth of what the chip uses at the moment. So this indicates that although modern chips are hit by thermal limits, the theoretical thermal limit set by the laws of thermodynamics is way, way less restrictive than what they're hit by at the moment. There is a, a great deal of room for technological improvement here. There's a paper by the other phys another physicist, Feynman, um, 1959, called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And in that one he argued that there was an enormous amount of, of space then available for technology to miniaturise things. He was talking about going right down to the level of moving individual atoms around, which can now be done by uh, scanning, tunnelling electron microscopes. And the Landauer calculation, which came out a couple of years later, showed that there was huge room still for improvements in thermal efficiency. You can see the original paper of um, Feynman in that link there. In the 80s, IBM, well, Landau was an IBM physicist. In the 80s, IBM put lots of effort into superconducting computers as a way of getting close to the Landau limit. Now, Feynman apparently 
wasn't aware of Landauer's work until the early 80s when Bennett brought to it to his notice. And in an 80, 1985 paper, Feynman went further and proposed a way round the Landauer limit. He suggested that if you had a computer made of reversible gates, then the increase in heat due to loss of information wouldn't occur. And he said, in principle, by quantum mechanics, you can construct computers which are non-dissipative, which don't gen generate waste heat. Now, he introduced what's now called the Feynman gate, and this is the diagram for the Feynman gate. It, it's obviously um, related to his convention for Feynman diagrams for particle interactions, but um, and he's, he's envisaging this as being due to single subatomic or atomic particles. It has this truth table here. Now, if you look at it, A and B are, can be viewed as inputs and P and Q as outputs. But if you look at the truth table, essentially A just gets copied to P. And B is the gets copied to Q being XORed by A as it goes by. So A is XORing with B in going to Q. Now, a consequence of that is that there's no loss of information, because if you look at the truth table here, you can always work out from what's in this row of the truth table, these columns of the truth table, which row it came from. Every one of these rows is different, so there is no loss of information. And Feynman f further went on to show that it was in fact in principle possible to create a Feynman gate following the laws of quantum mechanics. Now that was almost 40 years ago. Now four decades on from that we're beginning to see the ideas that he talked about being put into practical technology and the impasse that CMOS technology is heading for is gradually being bypassed by ideas which seemed very exciting but almost impossible to achieve when Feynman first put them forward back in 1985.